Hello and welcome to On the Right Track Career Stories, a video series and podcast about real people, their real careers and real lives. I'm Jane Christoffi, your host, and today I'm talking to Bay Riley. She's a lawyer turned entrepreneur, and she's got some great stories to share today. Now, why don't we just get started by you sharing with us what you do for a living? I'm a lawyer. Um, that's my trade. Uh, but I have had a real range of jobs and positions um, throughout my legal career. And now I'm, as we were talking about, I'm on a bit more of an entrepreneurial path now. Now, what area of the law is your focus? My focus is human rights and employment law. That has been, uh, I guess I've been practicing for 20 years now, and that's been a constant. So, Bay, tell us why you went into this area of the law. So I wouldn't say I saw this as my as my future or that it was a path that I knew was there, but when I look back, it makes sense. So I took history in university um, and I was involved in student politics. It wasn't so much that I saw that, okay, I'm going to be a human rights employment lawyer and this is how I'm going to get there. I really, I can look back and see how it all fit into place. I did go, I did go right into law. So I kind of and yes, and maybe in later high school, okay, I want to be a lawyer because I didn't really know what else to do. I stayed at Queen's for six years, so four years of the BA and then the MA um, for two years. And then I was at a turning point. So I worked for a year after to see, okay, do I want to do my PhD or should I go to law school? And I worked at a publishing company. So it seems off track, but again, my message for today is don't try to make sense of anything right now because you just, you don't know where it's leading. So don't try to imagine it. Um, exactly. Ended up working at doing copy editing and proofreading at a social sciences publishing company. And that was cool because I was, you know, editing history textbooks and I got to write the little back cover. And, but over that year, um, that's when I, I kept thinking, what am I going to do? So ended up getting into a PhD program um, and then just thought, I don't, it's too uncertain for me. I just, I want to, I want to be a something. Um, and so applied to law school and got in. For law, I think probably students want to know if I'm going to be a lawyer, what do I need to, what does it take? Mm -hmm. What do I need to be doing now? So I talk, I do talk to young people quite a lot and I think their parents want me to say this is what your kid has to do this or that it really doesn't matter is what i say it doesn't matter what you take because i think any can be a good background for law if you like reading if you like ideas if you like the news um people analyzing um big picture stuff helping people solve problems that's a great background and you can get that whether you do science whether you do engineering or arts. So I always say it doesn't matter what your undergrad is. Now, Bay, can you tell us some of the various roles you've played in the law in your career so far? Sure. So I have had the fortune of doing quite a few different things. A lot of lawyers stay in the same firm, uh, not as much anymore, but it used to be you articled. So articling is what you do after law school. So law school is three years. Um, you need to have good marks to get in and you have to write the LSAT, which is that standardized test. Um, and then you article after law school, which is you, a firm hires you on to, it's, it's kind of an old fashioned um, apprenticeship where a lawyer, the lawyers in the firm help train you in theory, that's what they do. Uh, and you get exposed to all the different parts of the firm and, and the practice. And then you write exams at the end. So I did article at a big firm. Um, again, I didn't necessarily see myself at a big firm. And I say this as well to people who's, when their parents ask, I say, even though you may want to be, you know, client, an environmental lawyer or a poverty lawyer, or you want to help vulnerable people, but it doesn't mean that you need to start off um, in a clinic, like a legal aid clinic or at a small firm. I personally, it's my bias. I think going to a big firm, um, they have great training. 
you get mm -hmm. exposed to all different kinds of law. I, I just remember watching people and, and being pretty awed by how efficient and fast some of those senior um, lawyers were. So, so what happened after articling? My first job was at a public inquiry looking into contaminated drinking water scandals. So, or disaster. Uh, and this and, was at a big firm, correct? Um, so I went with the lawyers from the big firm to the Walkerton inquiry itself. So it was a separate entity, but lawyers that I knew from articling were the, were on the commission council. So I became a junior commission council. Um, it was a lot of document review. Um, it was my first job. I was on a team with others, my age and stage. Uh, but it was, the inquiry was what happened, why, and how can we prevent it? So it was really a fascinating um, mm -hmm. project to be part of. I ended up going to an, a smaller firm after that. When you're at a big firm, I think the benefits are you get exposure to lots of different lawyers and, and areas of law. Um, you get paid well. Um, you have quite a lot of fun with a big group of other students and you make good connections for the future. And mm -hmm. a smaller firm, if you article a smaller firm, um, you could be on your feet more. So for example, I never did a examine. I never did a, anything in court as an articling student at a big firm. If you go to a criminal or a smaller firm, you're going to be in court all the time and learning on the job. So they're, they're different that way. Is um, one more hours than another? Like what's the work balance, work life balance, one firm to another? I think that's a really good question. A lot of people think if you're in government or at a smaller firm that the hours, um, or the expectations aren't as high. And they are the, I think they're the same wherever you are because you are always gonna do your best job. You are representing someone in legal proceedings. So you don't just go, well, I'm a, at a small firm. What do you expect? But yeah. as a lawyer, your duty is to your client no matter what firm you're at. Okay. And so you went from big firm to smaller firm, then what? Another public inquiry about um, a computer leasing scandal at the city of Toronto. Um, so I actually had, I was on three public inquiries, um, the drinking water, the computer leasing, and uh, the Ipper wash inquiry about the shooting of an indigenous man um, in an Ontario park. So those were big projects that were very fascinating with a real public purpose. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you're an entrepreneur and you're also a lawyer in your own firm. How yes. does that all happen? So again, you don't know where things are going. I never in a million years would have thought I'd have my own practice or my own business. And I say that not to be a modest, just, I just didn't see it. I was in public service for about 10 years between the public inquiries, um, the Ontario government in the constitutional branch, and also the Human Rights Commission and Human Rights Legal Support Center. So I had many years of human rights litigation and policy, mm -hmm. which really did bring me back to high school and university. So I was interested in politics and history um, and, you know, how people are treated in the world. I guess at a certain point, I thought I'm representing the person then the other side of the file means the big firm maybe was uh, representing the store where the person was uh, arrested in. I guess you can feel very trapped sometimes and feel like this is what I'm doing. I'm going to keep doing it. And then I thought, you know what, I'm going to, I had a big shake up and it was, a, it, it was something I never thought I could do because I thought, well, I don't know. What if I need to order a print? I don't, I don't have a printer or I don't have like someone, <laughs> I don't have the structure of a firm. I wouldn't know how to pay my insurance or get someone to fix my computer. And yeah. so it was really empowering actually to go, actually, you know what? Okay, just own someone or go to Best Buy and buy a printer. <laughs> you know, you just, again, things change and move and new opportunities emerge even as you get older, you're not in a static situation. So I was speaking at conferences about a new uh, legislation that made sexual harassment training mandatory for workplaces in Ontario. And I, people were asking in the crowd or I had clients saying, how are we gonna do the training? Like it's mandatory, do you know any online things for that? And then I started looking around and going, actually there's no. So I kept coming back to, you know, wouldn't it be cool to have 
a course or a way of training people that was not the corny DVDs and not me being the boring lawyer at a conference going section 42 sub B says the following blah, blah, blah. So I eventually just kept talking to people and going down this road of what a cool thing that would be. And then I eventually started a company and got some funding and made a really awesome digital learning course. So that's my new thing that I've, I still practice a little bit, but uh, my main focus is digital learning uh, for sexual harassment training. And it's this neat animated course. I'm doing sales, which I never imagined I would do. Um, and we're growing and obviously it's an issue that's really important. And again, it ties back to other things I've done. So it's what I, in university, I was on the women's issues committee and I studied, you know, women's history and all that kind of thing and went to law school. And, and so I see it coming together now. Yeah, it's fascinating, the direction or the path that you've taken. Um, what's your favorite uh, stage in your career? What have you loved doing the most? Wow. I, what I'm doing now, even though it's hard, uh, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you think that right out of the gates, after you finished you know, the exam for the bar, would you have been able to start a firm at that stage? I think things are speeding up a lot now. I think, um, I think people can start their own business, start their own practice, um, and do. I would never have wanted to miss any of the stages because it takes a long time to develop expertise and to master something. And it doesn't just happen overnight. I think it's probably old fashioned to me, but you have to go be put through your paces a bit. You have to uh, have a bit of struggle. You got to have work for mean people sometimes and get over it. And you got to figure out things that are really, really hard that you want to give up on. Um, because then you develop confidence and expertise so that you can go, you know what? I know what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do think, I actually think it's fine for a lot of people to start up their own practice relatively early mm -hmm. because sometimes it is hard to get an articling job too. You just want to make sure that you have mentors that you can count on. So if you are on your own, you, you call someone um, with more experience or different experience than you. Uh, and that goes both ways. Like you help, you help others and others will help you, but you need to lean on uh, um, those with expertise and make sure you know what you're talking about. Um, yeah. And usually that comes with, you know, years of experience and, and education. Okay. Those are great tips. What would you say to young people um, who are interested in the law? What's the most important skill or two that they should be working on developing right now? So if you'd like to be a lawyer, um, I think it's a great goal because no matter what you want to do, the skills to be a lawyer are useful for anything. So you need to be a good writer um, mm -hmm. because you're going to write a lot. Uh, you know, there were times where I was writing 20, 25 page opinion letters, which is write, like writing a big essay. So you got to be a good writer. You need to be able to analyze and synthesize. Um, you need to be detail oriented, but see the big picture. I think you should be someone who reads a lot of fiction, nonfiction, um, is up on current events. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and interested in other people and helping, helping them with problems. Okay. Now, looking back on your career, what would you tell your younger self? I would say, I would tell a, a few things, but I would say try yeah, try not to worry about seeing a path because there will be a string that ties things together. Um, and I would also say if you're not, uh, maybe this is a little on the nose, but if you're not with people who see the best in you, then, then move on. Be somewhere where you're going to thrive and don't be afraid to move if you're not somewhere where you will thrive. Okay, love it. Okay, Bay, we're going to wrap up soon. I'll let you get back to your regular life. But before we go, do you have any other interesting experiences you want to share with the viewers? I guess it comes back to, again, you don't know um, where that there's a path. Uh, and so it feels scary when you, when you don't know there's a path. 
Um, and so whatever you're doing, do it well and, and make the most out of it. So when I think about things tying together as a student, I worked in the Yukon, uh, do working at a restaurant, um, waitressing, washing dishes, um, that led to working at a college and becoming interested, the college there and becoming interested in Yukon history. Um, that's what I wrote my MA thesis on was women during the Yukon gold rush. Um, and then I found myself back there as a lawyer this past winter, um, working at the Yukon Human Rights Commission, working with them about sexual harassment policy for the territory. So that would have been my dream when I was washing dishes in Whitehorse um, 25 years ago to, you know, be a lawyer working at the, at the Human Rights Commission. But I didn't know that the way I actually got that law job there was because I'd worked in the cafe and I met, I met the person who's daughter eventually hired me to do a real job but every job is a real job and you don't know where it's going to lead and you take the most out of it I guess someone said it sounds so trite but always excellence so always choose excellence and I, and I, and I like that I love it okay babe last question if you weren't in the law what would you be doing a few things, um, but number one that comes to mind is I wish I wrote screenplays and novels. <laughs> Still do that. And novels, but so yeah. what I would say though is you can do the, like if, if you have some other dream, like I wish I was writing novels, then you still bring that into what you're doing. So maybe I'm writing like a legal policy, but my interest in writing is going to come through there. And I'm maybe going to be a little more creative with my policy. Because law is actually a creative job. I do think the best lawyers are really creative. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, these are wonderful insights and experiences. Thank you for sharing today. You've given us some really good advice and uh, inspiration. So thank you for your time today, Bay. Thanks, Jane. Really nice to catch up with you. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today. If you liked what you saw, give us a like. And even better, subscribe. Hope to see you soon.